item four, declarations of interest, um, which will be done by roll call. When your name is called and mindful of the new code of conduct, please state your declaration, including which agenda item your declaration relates to. State what exactly the interest is and the specific type of interest you are declaring. Alicia, thank you. Okay, so I'll start with yourself, Chair. Um, none that I can see, thank you. Okay, uh, Councillor Buka. None that I can see. Um, Councillor de Saram. Uh, none that I can see. Councillor Hookway. Uh, none, thank you. And Councillor Moulding. Yes, um, and it affects um, registrable interest on item number six, Southwest Museums, as I am a trustee of the um, Axminster Heritage Centre Museum. Thank you. And can I just ask if there's any other councillors in this meeting that want to declare an interest that might affect their ability to remain in the meeting for any of the items listed on the agenda? Nope, over to you then, Chair. Okay, thank you. So now move to agenda item five, um, introduction and updates from the ACE network. Um, we will receive a report from Sarah Elgadi, the cultural producer. So thank you, Sarah. And, thank and you, welcome. Joe. welcome. I'll just, thanks, Joe. I'll just interject. I'm just going to form an introduction for Sarah because her arrival is, um, is a very happy moment for us. Um, Sarah joined East Devon District Council in the role of cultural producer just last month, and she's going to be delivering our ambitious 10-year uh, cultural strategy. Um, Sarah is an experienced fundraiser, having worked in several de uh, development teams, including Punch Drunk and the Old Vic. Um, on Monday, we hosted our first ACE Network meeting in Exmouth, um, and it was uh, one of our most well attended. Um, and Sarah shared her exciting plans for the network and cultural development across the district. Um, and in the meeting, Sarah also introduced um, existing champions for the ACE Network and some new champions. And I thought this might just be the moment before Sarah goes in to share her exciting plans where the, the champions could just make themselves known on the forum. John Ashley. Yes, hello everybody. Um, just to clear out the mystery, I'm not Finn, not yet, anyway. Um, don't know where that came from. But um, yes, uh, we had a very good meeting. Uh, so I'm education chapter. Thank you, John. David? Uh, hi, I'm David Knox and I'm the music champion. Um, and my role is all about creating opportunities for musicians in East Devon. Thank you. And Joe? Hi everyone, I'm Joe Cairns. I'm the Museum and Heritage Champion and you'll be hearing from me later on as part of um, our, uh, myself and Vic Harding's presentation on um, museum development as well. Thanks. Thank you, Joe. And I'll now let Sarah share uh, news of the other champions and her exciting plans. Thank you, Sarah. Thanks, Ruth. Um, yes, delighted to be appointed and looking forward to delivering the ambitious East Devon cultural strategy. Um, so as Ruth said, we had our first network meeting, ACE network meeting of the year on Monday, um, and there was good attendance. Um, it, we had 33 people attending um, across a range of different sectors, including music, visual arts, theatre, literature, dance, um, unfortunately, there was a lack of representation from museums and heritage, um, so we'll be encouraging um, more uh, participants in that area going forward, and I'll be working with Jo, who, you, who just introduced herself, um, to get them more involved, and I'll be joining the East Devon Museum group coming up in a couple of weeks to introduce myself to them as well. Um, so, in terms of upcoming priorities, um, as you're probably aware we've been fortunate to receive funding from the Shared Prosperity Fund through the UK government um, and this will enable us to deliver a three-year cultural program um, and this relates directly to theme one of the cultural strategy which is strengthening and supporting the people that do 
Um, so with that in mind, um, one of my priorities is to launch an ACEST website. Um, and the response to that at the network meeting was really positive. Um, and in particular, um, ACEST members are looking forward to having a search directory where they can list their organization or their individual creative practice, um, and it will enable them to better connect and collaborate. Um, so hopefully that will, uh, we're planning for that to launch in June this year, um, and that's being delivered by COSMIC. Um, then the other priority is delivering a three-year training program. Um, again, um, it was evident at the meeting that there was a real need for fundraising training, so that was actually our first session. Um, that took place uh, last Monday on the 20th of February at the Beehive. Um, that was an essentials in fundraising course in person um, delivered by Cause4 Arts and Philanthropy. Um, and the response to that was really positive. So we'll definitely be running more of those sessions too. Um, coming up this week, uh, in fact, just tomorrow, uh, we will be starting marketing training delivered by Flying Geese. Um, and this um, is a series of six online sessions um, on Zoom um, and will cover a range of topics, including uh, communications, audience development, target audiences, branding um, and uh, campaign planning, monitoring and evaluation and so on. Um, so we've, we've got a good number of people signed up to that already. Um, I believe it was 12 yesterday, but we just put a reminder out yesterday as well. So hoping for a, uh, hoping for a few more signups there too. Um, I also gave an update on the Culture, Leisure and Tourism Fund, um, which is launching um, in April or May to be confirmed. Um, and that's to enable decarbonization of cultural um, buildings um, and uh, if, if eligible, um, you'd be, uh, well, grants would be between £2,500 to £20,000. Um, and it was great that we had Catherine, the climate change officer present at the meeting, um, who also was able to speak about the fund and that there's a drop-in session tomorrow as well um, for people to find out more information about how they can apply for this, um, this fund. Um, so in terms of uh, what else was covered in the meeting, uh, we heard from Simon Bates, a Green Infrastructure Project Manager with East Devon District Council, who spoke about um, the, uh, the Clist Valley Regional Park project. And we also heard from Anna Arusi, Engagement Officer, and Emma Maloney, um, Artist and AONB Partner, who spoke about their Roots for Roots project and gave an update on that. Um, other champions who were present, ACE champions, we had Anna Fitzgerald from Exmouth, um, who is the engagement champion. Um, mm -hmm. We also had uh, a new champion join us, Ellie Chadwick from Sidmouth, who is our new theatre champion. Um, and, uh, and we had apologies from uh, Gemma Gervin from Honiton, who is our craft champion, and Dr. Ella S. Mills, our decolonization champion um, based in Exeter. Um, so it was a good meeting. We were able to provide a facilitated network session focused around um, two different questions. Um, one was, what are you most enjoying about being part of the ACE network meeting and how can we improve the network? And in general, the feedback and consensus was that it's an incredibly helpful network to connect, to collaborate, to um, find out what's going on, to share best practice. Um, and then we also asked for feedback on what are the current biggest challenges your cultural industry is currently facing and what specific areas of training could the ACE network um, help support you with these in terms of training. Um, so the feedback from that was that the fundraising training in particular um, was super helpful and we'd like they'd like more of that. So we'll be delivering more fundraising sessions as mentioned. Um, and there were also suggestions on volunteer recruitment sessions and monitoring and evaluation. So we'll be delivering training programs around that as well, as well as the other areas identified in the cultural strategy. Um, 
There are also a few helpful website suggestions. I won't go into too much detail on that, um, but some, some helpful suggestions around having easily accessible go-to documents like risk assessments and, and that kind of thing. So lots of useful feedback to inform the website. Um, we also heard from Jane Rayner, the communications manager from East Devon Excellence, um, who has been commissioned by East Devon District Council to establish and run the East Devon Tourism Network. And part of the contract includes maintaining an online what's on listing of visitor and cultural events. Um, across East Devon. And so members of the ACE network will be able to um, send their listings directly to her for promotion. Um, and there'll be a link from the ACE website to the East Devon Excellence website where all that brilliant information will sit. Um, I should mention as well that, um, as Ruth said, I, I just started in January, so I'm obviously very new to the role, getting to know everyone. Um, and at the same time, uh, we also had a, a new um, a new position, uh, which was Jess, um, Jess McGill, who's the new arts manager with Exmouth Town Council, um, and she'll be delivering the Exmouth Festival. Um, so in terms of uh, just a reminder of the network meetings, we have three a year and we've confirmed that um, touring these around East Devon on a rotating basis at, at different venues um, will increase and maximize reach and accessibility. So we'll be hosting uh, the next one in June, the venues to be confirmed, but it will probably be Sidmouth or Axminster, Honiton, it will move around. Um, and uh, my instinct is that it's an incredibly responsive and dynamic group. And um, so we'll be encouraging them to generate the agenda for the next meeting. Um, and yeah, really looking forward to that. I'll also be looking carefully at who attended and more carefully at who didn't attend and reach out to those people um, just so that we can make sure we're really maximizing reach and everyone knows about the ACE network. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, although you've only been there for, you know, since January, it sounds like you've really hit the ground running um, and, and we're, we're all delighted to have you here. Um, thank you. Um, and I've, I've had some feedback on the, the training and the fact that it's being offered um, and that's been, that's, that's been really positive. And I think it's something that, um, the long term will, will make a real difference. So that's great. Do we have any questions from members or non-members? Councillor Bruce Desarum. Morning. Thank, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I, I think I think that that was a very um, very really good really good presentation and uh, very positive. And I'd look I'd like to ask how at the end of the three years are you go, sort of going to evaluate its, its success? Um, because obviously everyone wants it to be a great success. And, and I note that you're going to share best practices um, and you've started the training program and you do marketing as well. Um, I think with funding being such a tricky topic to obtain sources of funding for various groups and things, I think that clearly uh, one of the targets of success will be that you've got greater funding so that these things can be sustained beyond the three the lifetime of the three years. And I wondered whether you have have, have any thoughts on that? Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Sarah, do you feel? Yeah, so um, excellent question. And we will be absolutely monitoring and evaluating what success looks like. Um, so because we have funding from the Shared Prosperity Fund, they have very specific outputs and outcomes that we need to report against. Um, so I don't have them to hand, but they're things like, um, have we increased footfall to local events? How many local organizations have we um, financially supported or non-financially supported, for example, through training? Um, so there's a, a set list that will be that's mainly quantitative data um, but I'll be reporting against that and then longer term as you know the um, the cultural strategy is a 10-year strategy um, so they'll absolutely be um, be evaluation beyond the three years and beyond the SBF um, program and actually in the strategy it it's there's a, a really helpful section on what success looks like. And there's sort of measurable um, points like um, 
well, the, there's various things. I don't know how helpful it is to go into the detail here, but those are all points that I'll be measuring on the short term, medium term and long term impact. And we'll be going back to the people who have done the training in six months time um, to see whether there has been a, a change and an impact there and whether their three goals that they wrote down to achieve in six months, whether those have happened. Thank you. Very helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sarah, and thanks for the question, Bruce. Um, Councillor Ollie Davey. Ollie. Morning, Chair, and uh, apologies for arriving a bit late there. Technological no problems. Well, a bit of human error as well. But anyway, um, I just wanted to ask Sarah, and thanks for that interesting presentation. Um, you mentioned having, a, I think, an events listing, which you said would sit within the East Devon website. I just wondered what you're doing to direct people to that because I always think web-based information is only as good as the the fact that people know to find it there um, so I just wonder how people are going to be navigated towards that that's a good question and actually I've yet to meet with um Jerry, who's in the economic development team to discuss that further because she's managing the um, the contract and relationship with East Devon Excellence. And so it's very much in her interest from a cultural tourism perspective to be promoting it as much as possible. Um, but it's good that you brought that to my attention because that's definitely a question that I have as well um, because we need to let everyone know about it. Um, yeah, I mean, other than sort of the initial ACE network where we've got the Facebook group and so on that we can share it, um, it, it would be helpful to spread that more widely. Yes, thank you. Uh, and thanks, Ollie. Um, Charlie Plowden, Charlie. Thanks, Chair. Just a quickie, um, just to mention um, Fiona, Fiona Page-Turner, um, who was instrumental in helping to set up the UK Share Prosperity Fund just before Sarah came into post and is still involved. Um, and, and a tribute really to, to Fiona and also to Sarah because we only received notification from DLUC, I think it was the beginning of January, um, that we'd secured the three-year funding and the year one spend has to be committed by the end of this March. Um, so you can see it's been a huge amount of work and turnaround to put this ambitious programme together. So full credit uh, to, to Fiona and to Sarah for, for what they've achieved. And I know compared to some of the other strands, you know, we are ahead of the game. So I just wanted to formally recognise that, Chair. Absolutely. And, and I wholeheartedly second that. Thank you, Charlie. Um, John Astley. John. John. Sorry, sorry, sorry. At sorry. the meeting, at the meeting on Monday, in addition to what Sarah and Ruth have already said, um, I did encourage people to continue to write for my uh, community education column, which is in the Exmouth Journal, and I shall be also encouraging all people who would want to do any kind of listing or uh, in, collect information to use that. And I shall, I hope that I can work with whoever is involved with the listing program to get stuff into the journal. Uh, as everybody here knows, the journal has a worldwide readership and uh, we can reach a lot of people through that. So I shall continue to pursue that particular avenue. No, thank you very much. And I think, you know, and if anybody has um, <clears throat> local uh, press or, or contacts that can help spread, the, spread these messages, that's, um, th that's really, really useful. Um, and maybe that can be coordinated and, and, and a list of all those avenues gathered at some point. Uh, do we have any more questions at all? Okay, I, we do not have any more questions. So I would like to wholeheartedly thank Sarah again um, for the great work she's done already. Um, so now we will move to agenda item six, the Southwest Museums Partnership. And I'll hand over again to Ruth to introduce this. Thanks, Joe. Um, yes, delighted to have Vic Harding here, who was the programme manager for Southwest Museums Development and who was uh, who heavily inputted into the cultural strategy. And delighted to welcome her new colleague, Joanna Cairns, who is the Southwest um, Museum Officer for Devon. Um, over to you, Vic and Joe. 
Thank you so much, Ruth. Um, so I'm just going to screen share in a moment, um, but just to say in advance that I will take some of this presentation, but I will definitely hand over to Jo, who is our new Devon MDO, to talk a little bit about the work that she's been doing since starting in November. So just check that I can share this screen. And hopefully um, you can see that presentation. Can I have a confirmation, Ruth, that you can see that clearly? Yeah, we can see it. That's, that's and good. And can hear me clearly. Great. Thank you so much. So I'll begin. Um, well, firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to join the session today to talk about the work that Southwest Museum Development has been delivering um, to uh, the organisations, museums and heritage organisations <coughs> in East Devon. Um, before, as I always do, I'd like to talk a little bit about the museums themselves before we talk about the development work that we deliver. So I think some really important uh, point to make is that um, the development work that we do has to be influenced by the type of organisations and museums that we're supporting. This is essential to ensure that development intervention can be effective. Some factors that are really important about the Southwest Museum development sector, firstly, is the large, significant majority of those museums are actually independent charities. So many of them receive little, if any, public funding at all. A really interesting factor is that almost half are what we would call micro museums, so receive less than 10,000 visits per annum. We like to call that small but mighty. So basically the majority of those organizations, whilst they have small numbers of visitors, have huge impact in their localities. I think it's also really useful to um, provide a little bit of an insight about the ongoing impact of the pandemic. So whilst we hope that this season will be the first true season where we can get back to some semblance of normality and welcome visitors back without any interruptions from pandemic measures, it is important to recognise that visit numbers are still 43% down on pre-pandemic levels. So there is an ongoing impact on the organisations that we're working with and that we support. A big factor of this, which is incredibly, I would suggest, valuable about the museum sector in the southwest is that almost half are wholly volunteer run. That means they have no paid staff. This means that they are incredibly effective and embedded in their local communities. And also related a little to the size of um, the visit numbers is the factor around that over a third have less than a turnover of less than 25,000 per annum. So this means they are small organizations in terms of their business, but they're also relatively small in terms of the scale of visitors that they're reaching, but equally, very impactful in terms of their local communities. So as for further information um, on the statistics are provided here through our annual museum survey that provides not just information about the sector, but also provides valuable benchmarking data to support museums in their own performance management. So a little bit about Southwest Museum Development, just briefly, we're a team of museum and development heritage specialists. And we work with the museum and heritage sector in the southwest of England to effect positive, lasting change and importantly to deliver public value. We are an Arts Council funded sector support organisation and we have been one since 2018, but actually Southwest Museum Development was established in 2006 in the southwest, so we've been a while, around a little while. There's one of us in each of the English regions. So there's a version of Southwest Museum Development across England, and we often work collaboratively as Museum Development England. In terms of our team and the services that we provide, we provide specialist officers, and these officers and areas of their work reflect the priorities of the museum sector that's been expressed to museum development. So we have a conservation um, specialist on our team, a qualified conservator. We have a digital engagement specialist, a volunteering specialist, which I'm, as you can imagine from the previous statistics is a very important part of our team. And we also have a specialist museum development um, officer supporting audience development. And very importantly for the Southwest, unlike many of our other counterparts across England, we actually have a local place-based framework of local museum development officers. So in a moment, I'll hand over to Joe, but um, there's basically one of the Joes in each of the areas across um, the Southwest. We feel that's a very important, distinct part of our programme. It means that we can reflect not just working at regional level, but we really understand at sub-regional level the differences between the museum sector. So, for example, there are considerable differences of the museum infrastructure in Devon, say in comparison to the west of England with Bristol and Bath. The needs of those organisations and the scales of those organisations can differ quite considerably. 
We are also the primary training provider for museums in the region, regularly reaching upwards of seven, eight, nine hundred delegates per annum. And we also offer a small grant program. We have a small grant program that distributes our own funding, but we also work with partners such as Art Fund. And also we're pleased to be working with Headley Trust as well this year, distributing funding on their behalf. That amplifies not just the budget we have, but it also means the range of activities that we can fund through our small grant programme can be expanded. And we also ourselves support and fund projects through cohorts of museums, usually funded with organisations such as Heritage Lottery or other funders. So what do we deliver last financial year? So we've delivered uh, support to over 227 museums across the region. So in short, almost every museum or heritage organization with a collection has had some point of engagement with our program, which is an aspiration that we have to have as much reach as we can across the region. We also provide targeted support and grant application support to museums themselves. So not just funding for us, but supporting those organizations to secure and draw down funding for their own organizations. We reached over 227 delegates last year through in-person and online training. And we amplified that Arts Council grant by upwards of 40%, increasing the investment that we can provide to museums and the support that we offer. And so last year we were able to secure £90,000 from additional partners, Heritage Fund and Art Fund. And I know that we can hear a little bit more later from Ruth about some of the projects that were successful um, in East Devon. So at this point, I'm just going to hand over to Jo to talk a little bit about the role that she's been taking since she's joined us as MDO for Devon. Thanks, Vic. Um, hi, everyone. So, um, yes, I'm the new Museum Development Officer uh, and I cover Devon alongside Museum Development colleagues in each of the other counties um, in the southwest, as you can see from the map. Uh, I currently share the county with Alison Mills, who historically has covered North Devon and Torridge. But as of the new financial year, I will be covering the whole county. Uh, I'm full time and um, home based, uh, though I'm hosted through Bristol City Council as part of fixed um, team in Southwest Museum Development. Um, I just thought I'd say a little bit about the role of the Museum Development Officer, uh, which helps museums to achieve and maintain museum accreditation, which is a sector standard for good practice administered uh, by Arts Council. Uh, and the role also supports museums to develop uh, by accessing funding, um, training and signposts to programmes and sector support, as, as Vic's been mentioning, um, through Southwest Museum Development. Um, so Vic, if you could move to the next slide, thanks. Uh, so I just thought I'd uh, update you on what I've been doing um, during my first three months in post in relation specifically to East Devon. Uh, so I've made contact with all the museums in East Devon through uh, email introductions and also um, I provided regular updates on opportunities offered by Southwest Museum Development and other sector organisations. Um, I've actually been really encouraged by the response from East Devon Museums in particular. Um, they've been really welcoming and enthusiastic about the role and they just seem really engaged um, in the work that we're doing. Um, so it's really, really positive start. Um, I have organised the resumption of the East Devon Museums group meetings, uh, which had lapsed since the pandemic. Uh, these meetings uh, offer opportunities to network and share best practice. Um, several of the museums expressed um, an interest in resuming the meetings, so I'm really pleased that we have one set up um, for later, later this month at All Hallows um, in Honiton. Um, I've also been providing museum accreditation support, uh, firstly to Ottery St Mary uh, Museum, who are currently not accredited, um, but would like to join the scheme. So I've attended a site visit uh, and they're now, now um, going over the paperwork uh, to submit their eligibility to the scheme. So I'll be supporting with that. Uh, and secondly, Sidmouth Museum, who are already an accredited museum, but have been asked um, to submit their uh, five yearly return to Arts Council uh, and again I've attended a site visit with them and I'm supporting them um, to submit the paperwork by um, June this year. Uh, we've also set up some digital engagement workshops uh, which were offered due to interest expressed by the wider museum, uh, Devon Museums group. 
Uh, and these are two online uh, sessions led by our digital engagement specialist, Rachel Cartwright. Um, and I believe um, there's several East Devon museums who've signed up alongside uh, museums from the rest of Devon. And finally, I just wanted to mention that I'm working with Arts and Culture East Devon as Museum and Heritage Champion, which um, I was introduced earlier. And I um, attended the Fantastic Eights Network meeting in Exmouth on Monday. Um, well done to Sarah and Ruth. It was fantastic. Um, and I'm really looking forward to collaborating uh, with ACE to encourage partnerships uh, between museums and other arts and culture organisations in East Devon. So thanks. I'll hand back over to Vic for the next slide. Thank you so much. So just as usual, I wanted to provide you with a little bit of an overview about the investment that comes into Southwest Museum Development via the um, local authorities, East Devon District Council, Sidmouth and Budley Salterton. I think it's really important to um, be open and transparent about the sorts of services and activities that museums in East Devon are engaging in and how that investment is realised and return on that investment. So this breaks down, shows you a little bit around the uh, investment over the four years um, that we've delivered museum development services um, in terms of the Arts Council programme. So the Arts Council programme runs from 2018 to 2022 and we've been offered an extension of 22 to 23. And then we will be going into a funding process where we apply to continue to deliver museum development from 23 to 2026. Um, however, just looking back for a moment over the last four years, which is the last four complete financial years that we can have uh, generate data for, we can see that there's been a range of support services and good levels of engagement across the programmes. So we've had good pro engagement in special projects, the ones I mentioned earlier that draw down additional funding beyond the Arts Council's grant. We've had good levels of engagement, almost £2,000 worth of, of benefit in delivering training and skills. We've been able to distribute a little over five and a half thousand in our small grants program. So that's direct investment to the museums themselves to undertake projects and activities. And then we've also been able to um, direct what are in, in a way consultancy service in terms of those specialist support, which provides particular expertise and specialism in those areas of conservation and collection care, sustainable volunteering, digital engagement and audience development. So hopefully that's really encouraging to see that range and breadth of support being provided. And there are a number of particular engagement highlights. So Wimple Heritage, Sidmouth Museum, Fair Lynch, Al Hallows and Axminster Heritage. And shortly we'll be coming to the end of the current financial year. So I'll be able to provide that with an update, but we're just coming in just a little bit of a whisker before, before we can generate that data for 22 to 23. And when we do, we'll be able to celebrate the fact that we've been able to distribute some funding from Art Fund. So a really exciting programme called The Wild Escape. It was previously when I met with you called The Great Escape, but it's one of the same project. And um, this is a, an initiative being led by, Arts by Art Fund with funding from Arts Council. And we've worked with the Art Fund to be the distributor of the small grant programme. And I'm really delighted to say that we were able to award Valma Hubert Gallery and Honiton Museum a grant of £6,000, one of only two consortia in the southwest. So that's a really exciting initiative. And I know that's on the agenda later, so I won't, I won't cover any of that there, but I'm just really, um, really excited to see that project underway. It was a very tight turnaround which seems to be the sort of general way of things these days with funding opportunities. So it was just really great that um, Ruth was able to be um, responsive with that opportunity and look forward to hearing more about the project. Um, finally, just to say, um, we've just uh, published our annual review. I know that we will be distributing copies of those um, to each of our respective funding partners. So for example, Charlie will have a hard copy, but it is online. There is a link here. If you'd like any more information about the programme and how we've worked across wider Devon and across the Southwest region, please do take a look at that. But if you have any questions either today or afterwards, please don't hesitate to get in touch and contact us. Our details are here. Thank you so much. Thank you both very much. Um, as usual, a, uh, a fascinating insight into in, into what you've been doing, and welcome, uh, Joe. Uh, do we have any questions from the floor? You must have answered them all. Um, but as as Vic said, if you wish to, um, if, if if you'd like to contact them after the meeting, then you're you're more than able to. Thank you. 
Uh, thank you both very much. Um, so now we move to agenda item seven, the University of Exeter Creative Peninsula, and I will once more hand over to my colleague, Ruth Gooding. Ruth. Thanks, thanks Joe. Um, and thank you, Vic and Joe, for that really, really interesting presentation. And my colleague Anne will definitely be um, populating that with detail about all the exciting plans we've been up to this year. Um, but I'm delighted to um, introduce uh, Professor Tom Trevor, who is the director of the new MA at the University of Exeter on curation, contemporary art and cultural management. Um, Tom is also the director of creative art and Pr principal investigator of the AHRC funded Creative Peninsula project. The new Creative Peninsula Network will explore collaborative approaches to placemaking and cultural led regeneration in Devon and Cornwall. Thank you, Tom. Oh, thanks so much, Ruth. Um, brilliant to be here. Thanks for inviting me. I should probably say that I come from actually what they call industry in the in academia, which means I, I used to run arts organisations. I was director of Arnolfini and worked with local authorities. So actually there's incredible potential in the academic um, sector uh, in terms of research funding. So one of the reasons I've moved across is really to look at aligning that public and research funding, which I hope will be something we could explore further. Um, can I be made a co-host so I could share my presentation? Alicia? Yep, sorry, we're just doing that now. Bear sorry. with. Thank yeah. you so much. Uh. I can't seem to do it. Okay, so you should be able to do it now. Uh, I don't know why, sorry about that. Um, maybe I'll just tell you about it. That's probably the best thing. Uh, let's. Have you, it, the, the share screen green button does that act, has that been activated for you, Tom? Yeah, for some reason it's not allowing me to. No. Don't mind. Okay, well I'll just tell you about it. Uh, essentially, um, <laughs> this is it's an arts arts and humanities research council funded knowledge exchange project. So as I say, there's there is significant. Um, uh, research funding available and I think that's actually in terms of impact this is a really exciting way uh, forward so um, <coughs> Creative Peninsula is really aiming to um, explore collaborative approaches to place making and cultural led regeneration in in Devon and Cornwall um, as I say it's led by University of Exeter and in case you didn't know it has uh, Exeter has four campuses so as well as the two Exeter campuses it also has a campus in um, Penryn and one in Truro and um, the project really focuses on increasing access and exchange between urban, rural and coastal communities in Devon and Cornwall. Um, so obviously celebrating our distinctive landscape and, and our coastline, but also investigating all those complex social histories through community engaged arts programming and cultural inquiry. Um, if I if I was able to share my my uh, PowerPoint, which I, I will share with you subsequently, so you'll be able to look at it, but you'll be able to see some of the amazing projects that have been underway. But uh, really, the arts, uh, the sorry, the AHRC are particularly keen that we work with local authorities and museums and arts organisations to establish a network of partners um, around place, Devon and Cornwall. To, to help influence policy actually, and as well as creating these platforms with communities for retelling stories of place. So what that means is really finding new kind of narratives for our place and therefore working to overcome barriers to social inclusion, health and well-being, and um, environmental sustainability. So obviously this kind of thin wedge of land uh, that we live on this peninsula is kind of defined by its relationship to the Atlantic, um, but not just physically, but also culturally. I mean, the nature of the deter uh, this terrain has really determined it's made up of dispersed rural communities and coastal settlements. And it has a, a long history of seafaring, obviously, 
and uh, uh, and maritime expeditions. So think of places like Plymouth, for example, in the age of discovery. But that means that our economy is very much um, determined uh, by agriculture and fishing, mining previously, and obviously tourism. Now, this is where I was going to show you those uh, maps of uh, the indices of deprivation, because actually they tend to focus on urban centres. So when we look at the, the normal kind of um, uh, view is of those big urban centres, and we only really have Plymouth and Tor Bay, but actually when you zoom in to what they call the LSOA, which is the, the um, neighbourhood area, you can see the southwest has really uh, 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 pronounced um, levels of, uh, of deprivation. Obviously that um, is very relevant to the... Um, Leveling up agenda and the shared prosperity fund, which you've already tapped into brilliantly. Um, and Creative Peninsula builds on some work we've already been doing with Exeter City Council and um, the, the museum, Royal Albert Memorial Museum, actually, called Creative Arc. And um, that is kind of part of uh, the new livable Exeter strategy. As you probably know, Exeter is in the process of building 12,000 new homes over the next 20 years potentially 60,000 new residents in the city. So um, actually, uh, Karim Hassan, the, the uh, now retiring chief executive, was very keen that should be a culture-led process of, of development, talking about economic development as well. So that programme has really kind of um, formed around three specific um, themes, looking at health and well-being in the city, environmental sustainability, but also heritage and place. So as I say, think about social inclusion and so forth. Um, uh, we've also been working with um, a, a project which developed during the pandemic, looking at reconnecting uh, with the environment outside the box. So um, sorry you're having to watch me rather than these great pictures, but um, the way the Creative uh, Peninsula um, program has developed is really around these different stories of place. So. Um, uh, and this is something we just um, explored at a two day summit at the Eden Project in November, which uh, Ruth was part of. Um, and uh, just to, to kind of outline what they are. So, so first of all, thinking about our relationship to the Atlantic, but also all those histories of uh, maritime exploration, those colonial histories. So we, we've been working with the Black Atlantic Innovation Network, uh, led by Professor um, Paul Gilroy looking at those histories and, and potentially looking at how, how we can build programs around those. So we're working with the box in Plymouth at the moment on a major project for this autumn and so forth. Um, also thinking about um, the queer peninsula, thinking about all those histories of the, um, of the LGBTQ plus um, community and how that could be actually emphasized. And we're just working on a, a new project with CAST down in Penryn. Um, and um, I'm trying to remember all these different themes. So thinking about ruralities, particularly intergenerational ruralities, in a, in a sense, that kind of whole uh, class issue and, 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 and the remoteness of, of those dispersed communities I was talking about and how we can make connections across. What, what that kind of very particular sense of belonging uh, means and, and, and how we can support those communities, which is actually where in those indices of deprivation, a lot of that is in those rural areas. We've um, also been looking at the, um, as I say, outdoor cultures. And, and actually, as part of that, we um, have uh, commissioned a number of community participation projects. So this is, for example, one of the um, uh, areas which has come into East Devon. Um, so we worked uh, with a group called um, Mason Sermon Winters with sea swimmers actually on Exmouth Beach and the Exmouth um, Rescue Club uh, in in the height of the kind of the hot, one of the hottest days of, of July I think it was and they they did a series of choreographies you can see all this on the website actually which I'll put a link at, into the chat for you um, then also we worked with Tidelines who are based in Exmouth uh, in your area to do a salmon run. And this was actually following the route of the salmon to its spawning grounds, the Atlantic salmon, and through a, a, a relay race, actually starting from Exmouth, this sort of crack of dawn. This was in September. 
and then actually with families and all sorts of communities joining in running this um this baton of a, a salmon actually all the way up um, the river x to exmoor which was incredibly um well attended and actually i hope could become an annual event uh, thinking about all those kind of barriers along the way which uh, prevent uh, more than human species from from uh, living their lives in our new kind of environmental crisis etc and then a third uh, commission that we um, worked on with a group called Small Axe was down in Penryn, looking at food production and, and cooperative um, uh, community um, work. There's a, an area of land called Loveland, just outside Penryn actually, which the Falmouth Food Cooperative had purchased to prevent it from being developed. And that um, <clears throat> um, was taken on and uh, as part of this day, celebrating all the different food that was being grown and the histories of food in, in Cornwall specifically, <coughs> a whole series of events, um, performances and talks on that area, uh, culminating in a big feast of locally grown food. Um, now then, what have I left out from that presentation I was going to show you? So um, essentially, we hope to work closely with, with as I say, local authorities and museums and, and arts organisations to develop this network approach so i hope that we'll be able to have another um summit coming up in 2023 we're actually we've um joined up with a consortium um through the uk research um sector looking at what they've called local policy innovation partnerships and there is if we are successful working with the southwest sector actually there's really significant funding there and that's something that we really would specifically like to work with um local authorities but obviously very uh keen to build on our relationship with ruth and anna at uh, thelma Holbert gallery too now i'm sorry i couldn't show you those uh, lovely images i prepared for you but um i will give you the link in the chat for our website so do have a look at that and i'll share the presentation so you can look at it subsequently are there any questions do you have any questions uh councillor bruce to Sarum. bruce yeah, thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, yeah, a very interesting talk. Um, as, as one of the um, Exmouth members present, I, I was particularly pleased to hear your talking, your work about the tide lines and your salmon run. Do you, do you yeah. think you will make it an annual event? Because I think from a point of tourism and visitors to Exmouth, it could be very positive if the event is well publicised and, and has good outcomes for those who want to take part. So I think, you know, it could be a very good, a win-win situation if you, if you were to, to make it an annual event. And I would look forward to hearing your comments. Thank you so much. Oh, I very much hope so. And as I say, the kind of sheer range of people who got involved was so brilliant. I mean, the, um, a lot of families, but also I seem to remember people from uh, Exmouth. There's someone who, who runs the uh, ice cream shop on the front and she was very excited about getting involved in actually something that was very meaningful in terms of climate crisis, the sea level rise and so forth. So, yeah, I, I mean, we definitely work towards that. Tidelines are, are championing it. So it's up to them if they want to um, take that forward. But I, I believe they will because it's it's uh, been a great success. So I will certainly try and raise funding. But this is something where on the longer term, we'll have to look to our, uh, you know, uh, partners in the public sector, too, because we've kind of used this research funding to, to kickstart things. And we'll see how it develops. Thank you. So, that, so that's that's kind of your purpose, is it, to to, to get things going and, and and sort of educate people as to how to do them, develop them, and then and then you look for other, you know, that you you pass them on to the people that you've worked with and hope that they take them forward. Um, yeah. Well, I mean, if you, I mean, it is really a bit like a parallel universe, that academic world. So there's such a lot of expertise there, obviously, and so I suppose really a fundamental um, objective is to bring that together with with kind of the community um and that for that we need our cultural institutions and our local authorities to really help that so it's kind of how to unlock all that um knowledge and make it useful and really apply it but also the funding that goes with it too i mean I, i'm rather over stressing that but i do think there is real potential in that thank you uh councillor nick Hookway. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Tom, for your presentation um, and your talk. Uh, I've just had a quick look at your website. That's uh, um, very informative. Thank you. Um, two points, really. Firstly, echo 
Councillor de Sarum's comments about tidelines. I've met Joe and Anne-Marie and uh, very pleased to hear that they are involved uh, with uh, what is a very interesting and uh, exciting project on salmon and uh, their impact uh, on the, the environment. Uh, but also my ears pricked up when you mentioned that funding was available uh, and also you're interested in issues to do with placemaking uh, because we are looking at um, a placemaking in Exmouth uh, town and the seafront. And we have recently appointed um, a consultants to that effect. Uh, so very interested to work with you on that and to see if we can um, get some uh, new initiatives going. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. As I say, there, there's this thing, LPIP. I don't know if you've come across this, Local Policy Innovation Partnerships. No. So um, uh, it's really quite substantial funding <clears throat> from UKRI. Um, but they've they've uh, because it's um, uh, really to fund four or five projects nationally. They've uh, we've had to team up with Bristol and Bath as well, which is kind of I, I think our place can be defined in terms of Devon and Cornwall. But in order to access that funding, so uh, we should know surely if we're through the first round. If it's the second round, then there is uh, quite really uh, positive um, funding from that, and it'd be great to work with you on it. Thank. You. I'll be in touch. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, cheers, Nick, and cheers, Tom, for that. Uh, Charlie, Charlie Powell. Thanks, Joe. Uh, just following up from Nick, I'll be in touch as well. Uh, Tom, that was fascinating. I'm the um, Assistant Director for Countryside and Leisure here at East Devon District Council. And just to sort of almost complete that circle of sort of discussions you mentioned about the activity in Exeter, Sarah, our new culture producer, and I met with Dom Jinks yep. last week, who you obviously know exceptionally well. And um, he's also keen to look at how we can sort of tie in closer collaboration as well. So I think there's a conversation to be had with yourself uh, and um, Dom as we sort of go forward to explore how we can further um, develop those relationships, obviously, with, with the university and the work that's going on uh, with X. There's a lot of synergy, I think, you know, that, uh, that needs to be explored. So really excited about that. And I'll be in touch, as they say. Thanks ever so much. Yeah, I, I do work very closely with Dom. He's uh, they ha the university is called IIB. The uh, oh, I, just, I should innovation industry and business. I think it is the part he's in. So he's my kind of counterpart. Then we, we've yeah. worked um, yeah on Creative Arc too. Looking Lovely. forward to talking further. Thanks, Tom. Nice one. Thanks, Charlie, and uh, thanks again, Tom. That was um, that was fascinating. If you could send the um, if you could send your your slides through. Uh, maybe send them to Ruth. Is yeah, that I, okay? will. I will do and, that. Sorry. And then we can get them distributed. Um, sorry, Joe, I think Wendy, Wendy had a hand up. Sorry, Joe. Uh, uh, I can't say that. Wendy? Hi. Hi. Hello. Hi, Hi Tom. Oh, your hand disappeared. Sarah. Okay, that's fine. Go for it. <laughs> sorry, I should have just done more there, frantic waving. <laughs> Tom, that was fascinating, really amazing. Um, and I just wondered, have you linked up with the West Country Rivers Trust and the area of outstanding natural beauty people? Because um, I know Chard Stock uh, doing a Kit River um, project at the moment. And I was amazed to find that they have um, salmon spawning in the River Kit, which is right in the Blackdown Hills. It just, uh, yeah, sorry, I got excited when you mentioned the salmon and the spawning. And I thought, oh, there's so many possibilities here, all these. And we're trying to clean up the rivers. And I just thought, wow, that's fantastic. Can get you on board. Yeah, oh, sorry. Thanks so much, Wendy. Actually, you reminded me of one of the, the uh, themes I forgot to mention is the uh, Parliament of Waters. So what we want to do is really encourage local communities to, to, to give a voice to their local body of water, if you like. And then the Parliament of Waters is a way of those uh, different bodies of water having a conversation. So um, we actually started this uh, the summit uh, with a conversation. I think um, there was the X, the Dart, the Tor and the Red River from Cornwall. So I don't know, uh, it'd be great to hear from the kit. And- uh, Yeah, the kit I, and I, the axe. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, there's lots of potential there. And then, then we can have an international conversation as well, of course, but actually beginning with our regional uh, rivers and estuaries is a really great way of having that conversation, I think, thinking about how we can speak up uh, or how the water can hold us to account for what we've been doing to it. Absolutely. Yeah. Oh, well, I'll get in contact. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, okay, so if there aren't any more questions, we will say thank you very, very much to Tom. 
and move to the next item on the agenda, which is uh, item eight, Villages in Action. Um, and we will hear from Wendy again and Mayor George, and I'll pass you over to Ruth for an introduction. Thank you. Thank you, Joe, um, and thank you again, Tom. Um, Mayor George is the programme manager for Villages in Action, um, who produce work in everyday spaces, working with a team of collaborators who are passionate about their communities and want to create positive change in Devon. And also we'll be hearing from Wendy Vanderplank, who has been a village promoter and performer for 22 years um, and is now on the board of trustees at Villages in Action. Um, Wendy was also, up until very recently, the programme and event manager at the amazing Beehive. Um, thank you both. OK, so hopefully you should uh, all be able to see my screen. Um, lovely to be with you all today. Um, so uh, thanks, Ruth. As, as Ruth mentioned, uh, I'm joined by Wendy van der Plank, uh, who's been a volunteer promoter for over 20 years. Quite incredible, really. Um, She's a trustee on the board, as Ruth mentioned, representing the promoter view. So we work largely with volunteer promoters. Um, but since January, Wendy has also been working on a national lottery funded project called Village Exchange um, as a community animator. And we'll hear a little bit more about that in, um, in a few minutes. So uh, as a quick reminder, we are, oh, I'm not gonna be able to change this. Sorry, Zoom likes taking over my computer. I'm gonna see if I can move on to the next slide. Hopefully that works. Um, so as a quick reminder, we are a charity that works across Devons, towns and villages. Our core purpose is to enable and promote engagement in the arts, uh, largely the performing arts, uh, but we do was, uh, work across a number of art forms. So we aim to empower communities to develop, organize and sustain their own cultural activity, enhancing quality of life, social inclusion, self-confidence and enterprise. Our ongoing work enables community participation in the arts through activating or presenting creative work at grassroots level, building a network of people who engage and identify as artists, art enablers and supporters. I last presented to this forum uh, in, in October. Uh, so this slide just shows a few performance and workshop highlights that have taken place since October. Uh, the first image you can see with uh, the goats puppet. So this was Running Dog Theatre, uh, building on a residency by Running Dog Theatre Company in 2021. Josh and Emma returned to Stockland for another week of mischievous fun. Rather than simply arriving in a community to perform just for one afternoon or one evening and then leaving the next morning, the company worked with Villages in Action and local promoters to deliver wraparound creative activity and engagement in the week leading up to the performance. Opportunities included goat bombing, filling the local village with locally crafted goats, uh, a goat themed pub quiz, as well as a chance to meet the goat puppet at the school gates. This all went down a storm and there was an audience of over 90 people in attendance in the local village hall. Moving on, we can see the get together by Mama Tokus. Um, it's a show designed to be uh, to, to create collective joy in people uh, and communities with infectious tunes, fun participation and a whole lot of heart. Then we're moving on to the image below with the tree. So this is a performance of Hansel and Gretel, which was a festive treat for families presented by Paddleboat Theatre Company. Um, it's an inclusive version of uh, Hansel and Gretel. It's a sensory story full of magic, gentle interaction and integrated British sign language. This is a company that really champion inclusive work. We also had no image on the slide, but two performances um, by two qu uh, queer spoken word artists, both in Exmouth and in Seton Libraries. And this was part of a wider Devon based project working with LGBTQ plus artists and audiences. Uh, we act, Villages in Action acts largely as a broker and we facilitated links with the Beehive in Honiton and an organisation uh, making environmental uh, work using crafts called Significant Scenes. Currently, um, you can see the Quarantine Quilts exhibition uh, on display at the Beehive for the next two days. So uh, you have to be quick with this one. Um, this was a Devon wide project where quilt pieces were created during the lockdown by people experiencing uh, loneliness, isolation uh, and so on. So a little bit of a brief uh, overview. 
Um, the next slide shows some feedback um, that we have had from uh, from audiences between October um, and now. And I just wanted to highlight one uh, last event. It took place um, this Saturday, just gone. Uh, we worked with Martin, a, pr a promoter um, in Orliscombe, to present Perception Gap. It was an evening of African diaspora performance with music, storytelling, and traditional Syrian food. Uh, Perception Gap explored the psychological pressures facing an African refugee outsider. Audience feedback has been um, has reflected that the piece was moving, joyous, and deeply intelligent, with a lot of audience members commenting on how this kind of work never normally makes it into rural spaces. So we're really proud of, of championing this work. In summary, from April 2022 to where we are today, over £3,500 has been taken in box office income alone from 12 local events with additional money made on bar takings or, or refreshments. Over 620 audience members have experienced a Villages in Action show in East Devon, with another few hundred taking part in creative workshops or other engagement activity. I'm now going to hand over to Wendy to speak a little bit about our Village Exchange project, uh, which aims to build on hyper-local work that we're doing in East Devon. Over to you, Wendy. Thanks, Maya. Cheers. Hello, folks. Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be working with Villages in Action, uh, uh, exploring links, connecting people, working with folk in three separate communities. So. Um, I'm sort of looking at what's happening now and what's wanted and how to develop that and to help facilitate so that local people can shape and they're encouraged to take part and shape their own creative and cultural initiatives. Um, so we're not like parachuting stuff in, we are actually consulting and finding out what people love and like and how we can build on that. So um, I'm working currently in Honiton. Um, with the Memory Cafe, Honiton Carers and the Shedders. And we started by um, having the idea of doing photo journaling and some craft activities wrapped around that. Um, it's, it's just evolved, it's been amazing. I got, um, uh, we got a local chat in who uh, is an ex-mayor, ex-Bobby, and really, really good at telling tales. He's a great raconteur. He's got great local knowledge. And um, he's also a very skilled photographer. So we encourage people to bring along their photos and talk about them. And just the whole session was quite amazing. And people just retrieving memories and we talked about making memories it was a gentle intro just to encourage people to bring along their favorite photos and talk about them and Vernon was such a hit he's got this special app which we've both got now which colorizes black and white photos and I mean yeah it was incredible and the feedback we've had so far has been really good like one said um one lady said, a brilliant project and thank you for making my mum feel so included. And it was lovely, this was someone else, it was lovely to see everyone sharing their, their photos and through that learning more about each other's lives. So um, we're, we're working on that and building journals and we've got a special memory cafe journal um, and just the discussions have been brilliant. So that's what we're building on and we're doing a special crafting, coronation crafting, and we've spoken with the museum, All Hallows, and um, another chap who's really interested in local history. And we're putting together a big slideshow with coronation pictures and stuff to go on in the background whilst we're doing the coronation crafting which is another um, local crafting lady who's really, you know, she's, she's great. She's, she's loving it, coming up with different samples and things. So that's brilliant. And then we're going to have a relaxed afternoon performance in the Mackiness Hall with Trip helping to get more isolated people in, the befriending and um, the shedders. It's, it's open to anyone anyone so you're all welcome you're welcome to come um but it's on the monday the 24th of april and there's a 60s 
duo, local musicians, they're going to come along because the one thing that I've realised is that people really like to groove, they like to sing. We went along to the get together at the Beehive and it brings such joy. It's wonderful. And there are a lot of people out there who are quite isolated and the thing that I learned from my time at the Beehive certainly is a lot of people love a safe space where they, they, they can come along on their own and they know it's going to be sociable and friendly. So, okay, so that's what we're doing with Honiton. And moving on, there's, there's legacy there as well. I have to say there's loads of, this is a pilot and there's lots of different things that I think we can develop and subject to future funding, really build on this. Um, by the, the next place where we're working is Ottery St Mary. Um, that was more challenging, uh, personally, because I don't really know that community very well. So it's been really interesting going in and um, seeing various, meeting various different people, different organisations like the 06 um, Project, uh, Graham's fantastic, and Dave Knox, who is part of the Arts and Culture East Devon Forum, who's the, he's, he's the music champion. And I think you'll be hearing from him later, but he's really got something great going on there with the young people. And we wanted to build on that and feed into what he's already doing there. I went to a gig that he promoted on Saturday night with the cabins and managed to speak to some of the young people in the audience and they really want more music in the town. Um, so it's, it's something that we're looking at. And um, over the Easter holidays, we've got Emily Howard and the Mobile Music Hub coming into the station hub, um, which uh, Graham, at the 06 project has helped us to facilitate. We're going to, we're going to have a couple of days working on just a gentle session initially aimed at targeting young people from, um, you know, that have been isolated, home educated people. And we're going to reach out to pupil, uh, premium pupils as well. Um, and with making contacts within the school and within the local community and really trying to build on that to get so young people along to have uh, gentle music making sessions, working towards composing and songwriting with young local musicians coming in as well to talk about DIY promo, about uh, in the music industry, because the cabins are really taking off now. And uh, I'm hoping that Dave will be there, Dave Knox, because he's got industry experience and promo knowledge. So. It's about getting, you know, the locals involved, local creatives involved and hoping that it'll really get legs and start to run. So that's that. Um, yeah. Um, what else was I going to say? Yeah, we're, we're hoping that, that we may be able to make a music video and feed into the Ottery Food Festival, which Dave, I'm sure, will talk about later. So I'm going to leave that to him. Um, and but the, the, the other community that we're working in is Membry, which um, I'd, I'd seen a, a thing go out on their newsletter saying, we're really desperately looking for ideas for um, more community productions because they've got a really active, retired sort of um, community there. But it's, it's intergenerational, the theatre company that they have. And they've got Membry History Society, which is very active. So we wanted to link all of these um, organisations together and build on that, and particularly the rich history, the heritage in, in the village. It's extraordinary. I mean, they've got a Quaker burial ground. They've got um, where Judge Jeffreys condemned 80 of them to death. I mean, it's ghastly civil war skirmishes they've got a world war ii auxiliary listening post which is in an outdoor lab been down there it's extraordinary so um there's all these wonderful histories and stories and we've got a brilliant actor called philip robinson who is doing a show the launch show there called um every brilliant thing uh it's an award-winning play and um it's heart-wrenching it's funny and it's fabulous so if you can come do that's going to be on Saturday the 18th of March at 7 30 but prior to that we're going to have a social supper and prior to that 
Philip is going to do, um, he's a really experienced workshop facilitator as well. He's going to do an afternoon workshop, stories to stage. It's going to be more active, fun. Um, yeah, and that's a two hour workshop. But we've also then in future, we've, we've got Claire Viner, who's a Blackdown Hills storyteller. She works with the area of outstanding natural beauty and the Blackdown Hills um, quite frequently. She's, she's really experienced. She's going to come and work with people that are, there's quite a few creative writers and the History Society, we hope are gonna come along to develop our stories, local stories. And she, she's done, yeah, she's, she's a really good workshopper. So it's about building the bones for the stories and then running with them. So there's that. And um, we've got Saturday Social with the Merrymakers where we're going to discuss the stories that we want to develop. And then um, some of the memory Merrymakers, I saw them in their panto last week, it was brilliant, <laughs> a hoot. Some of those are going to be reading the stories that we've been working on the creative writers and um yeah and then we're going to have an oak apple cafe session and we'll be um exploring the stories and workshopping with the children as well so they don't feel excluded because we've got an evening do um and another chap in the village who's really into his ai and tech he's going to gather all of the different stories and try and come up with his chat robot you know gb chat robot um ai story so we're going to have that performed as well um yeah i think that's about it but really it's just about um giving giving inspiration and hopefully you know really building on it I'm thinking you know possible open mic continuous continuing open mic sessions in Ottery thinking about a, a real um, good community production as well in Membry and continuing the, the crafting and pulling different people in with the the Memory Cafe and perhaps more lunchtime concerts because I think that's something that's lovely to do in various different venues and uh, I think that's it really thank you thanks Wendy I just want to just finish off uh, our presentation just by saying um, that as Wendy said this is a pilot the way that we are working in East Devon and we've secured additional funding to be able to do that um, um, we work across Devon, but the way that we work with uh, East Devon is, is kind of advancing much more quickly. That's largely down to the support of East Devon District Council, which is uh, fantastic. Uh, so we are working hard to leverage additional money and bringing that in um, for creative activity, you know, um, in, in, in that part of, of the county. Um, so hopefully we can do, we'll have a really successful pilot project and we can do more of this working in a really hyper local way. Um, any questions would be really happy to to answer anything. Thanks very much. OK, um, Joe, I think has was gone. Uh, no, I haven't. I'm on mute, Nick. Okay. Sorry. Um, yeah, um, just uh, this might be a good point, actually, for me to uh, for, for me to say apologies. Work is calling. Uh, errant children being errant. I am going to leave now and hand you in the uh, leave you in the capable hands of the councillor Nick Hookway. Um, and I will catch up with the rest of the meeting on YouTube at a later date. Thank you very much, everybody. It's been fascinating so Thank far. Thank you, Joe. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Joe. Sure. Enjoy the day. Okay. All right. Okay. Thanks, Joe. So um Thank you indeed to uh, Mayor and Wendy for your presentation. Uh, are there any non-members uh, who wish to uh, pose any questions? <coughs> I can't see any uh, hands. Uh, is that right? Okay. Um, so any members, please? Anybody else want to pose a question? Oh, Councillor Andrew Moulding, please. Yes, thank you, uh, Nick. And uh, thank you, Wendy, for your excellent talk. And I'm very great supporter of Villages in Action. And I'm particularly interested in Membry, which is very near to um, where I live. And uh, I um, represented Membry on the County Council for a number of years and, and was very much aware and still am of all the work they do, particularly with the merry, merry makers. And so I'm delighted that Villages in Action is going to be involved with Membry and I shall certainly go along and 
support whatever they do. They're a very active and lovely community. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Councillor Mulden. That's very kind of you. Right, okay, so, so I haven't seen any more hands up. Um, I'll see if I miss anybody, please shout out. Okay, um, right, oh yes, um, Jess, Jess McGill. Uh, what have we got there? What's going on there? Hi, sorry about uh, that. It's just um, my mouse was running away. Hi, yes, um, I'm the um, uh, arts manager in Exmouth and um, organising the Exmouth Festival this year. Um, it sounds really amazing, all that um, work that's been going on with the Villages in Action. Um, I just wondered what um, plans are, obviously, in, in brief for, for the future, what other areas you might be working in? Sure, so we are currently waiting to hear back. Um, we are just reaching the end of a project grant, so we are not core cool funded, um, but we received project grant funding from Arts Council <clears throat> England. Uh, so we submitted an application before Christmas uh, to continue our work across Devon for the next 18 months. Uh, so we're waiting to hear back from that. We should hear back in the next couple of weeks. So hoping for a, a successful application there. Um, and essentially we want to build on this work that, that we are doing. So. Um, four kind of key strands of our work. One is absolutely continuing the touring uh, uh, touring performance that, that we currently host and, and participatory workshops that go alongside that. Developing the network much more and developing a, um, we already have a really strong network in East Devon, a number of very active promoters um, and we want to build on this. So, it, you know, employing Wendy from January of this year has been, as I say, a, a, a something new that we've done. Um, but what I really would love to see over time um, and, and you know, over the 18 months of this project is that the East Devon cluster really forms uh, into, it. you know, not its own entity, very much connected, but that it is really responding to those uh, really hyper local, um, uh, you know, concerns coming from residents or, or whatever it might be. Um, so that that feels like a really kind of fundamental part of what we're doing. Uh, we're also uh, sort of receiving commissions from other organisations who are recognising the work that we're doing in in rural Devon. Um, so some of the larger uh, kind of cultural spaces and the urban centres have been in touch about working together um, within our rural community. So um, I can't really talk about many of those right now, um, but but I will absolutely bring all of that information to this group as soon as as soon as we're uh, successful about the. Uh, uh, ho hopefully waiting for a successful uh, funding application um, but building on what we're doing we've very much been trialing things over the last 18 months um, and and so we'll be moving forward with those projects that have been really successful um, that's kind of our large focus at the moment really. Great thank you. Okay thank you very much indeed well, I can't see any other hands up so we'll move on then to um Agenda item nine of Wild Hullerton, and we have a presentation, I believe, from James Chubb. Is James here? Yes, yeah, I'm here. Thank you for inviting Good. me along. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll share my screen and get the presentation up for you and give you uh, the host has disabled participant screen sharing. If I could share my screen, then I'll uh, get the just presentation up and run you through. Bear with, we'll just meet your co-host, James, okay? Happy, thank you. Okay, you should be okay. That's brilliant, thanks, Alicia. Yeah, I, I shall whip that up and put it on to, sorry, Simon. Right, put it on to full screen. Right, can everyone see that at full screen? Perfect. Yep, lovely, excellent. So yes, Wild Honiton, um, I thought I would start with um, just a, a quick overview of what the project is aiming to do for anyone who's not heard about it or been in contact with our predecessor, which was Wild Exmouth. Um, so we got in 2019, we were awarded Heritage Lottery funding um, for a three year project based in the town of Exmouth. Um, to do a very similar set of, of ambitions. 
Um, and that came with its own uh, project officer and was a lot more of, a, of a, a separate and standalone function. But what we've learned from that and also how the, the, um, the project got disrailed by, by COVID and then scrambled back together, we've, we've put together um, the Wild Honiton approach, which is more of a partnership led project um, that we're coordinating with key stakeholders in and around the town. But the two themes remain very constant in, in looking to um, assist nature recovery within the town and its um, immediate environment, um, and also nature connection. So the people who live in the, in the town, how connected do they feel to the special wildlife that um, they share the town with? And um, also how can they do more to help it in the local green space, but also their own um, private gardens and things. So um, our uh, My Bit for Nature um, element of the Wild Exmouth project was a really um, big hit and encouraged people to do any degree of, of work on their own patch from a, a small corner of um, longer uh, grass and, and wildflowers to completely rewilding their entire garden and everything in between. And actually, if you start to piece together all the privately owned land around the town, you actually um, develop a huge area that um, can help support nature recovery. Um, we're also looking at how connected to the public green space people feel. And it was all um, stemmed from some survey work carried out by um, one of our previous team members, uh, Will Jones, back in 2020. Um, so we're Growing on from um, what we learned at Wild Exmouth and looking to develop some experiences, events and projects that are specifically tailored to, um, to Honiton. Uh, so going to hang it all from two flagship species, um, which are particularly special to the town. Um, sadly, the first one, hedgehogs, you normally see as roadkill around the town, which is a horribly grisly thing to sort of pick up upon. But it does have a positive underlying uh, message that actually the hedgehog population in Honiton is, is doing very well. It could do with some help. Um, and there are some really simple steps that people can take uh, in their own gardens to help hedgehogs. Um, and uh, we could do with some traffic calming measures, certainly around um, the, the Tesco side of town, um, which is where the majority of, of roadkill that I see is. Um, but uh, they're such an endearing species, they're going to form um, one of the flagships for, for, the, uh, for the project work. And um, I'll pick up a, a, a little piece about them um, later with our public green space uh, slide. The other charismatic mammal that I'm keen to include in, uh, in the, um, the dialogue uh, to do with this project are beavers because um, we have obviously the um, resurgent beaver population on the River Otter and for the last two summers um, a supposedly well thought to be male beaver has actually taken up residence on the Gissage and is living right in the heart of the town centre and regularly um, pottering about underneath the, uh, the main road on the culvert there and going between um, the community orchard um, to the north of the main road and then down to the sort of wooded area of, of river behind the beehive. And um, the number of people who've asked me what I'm doing when I'm sort of careering about in the undergrowth down on the, on the gissage and uh, think that I've been uh, rather um, haphazardly hacking away at small, uh, small trees and shrubs and when I tell them it's actually a beaver that's living down there and uh, keeping itself to itself, uh, they're absolutely gobsmacked. And I'd like more people in the town to know that these, these animals are here and also that they are, they're going to be bringing some dynamic change to how we see the landscape and the wider countryside. But they certainly don't represent um, a threat to what we enjoy about Honiton and, uh, and the green space. And I think those myth busting elements are really important to do with this new large species. I mean, a big female beaver, the largest one that's ever been um, recorded on the otter was 30 kilos in weight. So they're a big, hefty animal. 
um, and they are now our new neighbours. So they do need, um, well, a formal introduction, I'd say. And that's what we're going to aim to do through the uh, various strands of the project. So as well as having some sort of key uh, wildlife figures to uh, to tell stories about, we've also um, developed um, a, a thread of public events, which we do across the whole district. Um, but these are very much tailored specifically for residents of Honiton itself. Um, I'd be really disappointed if we ended up, um, say, at the Family Fun Day, where we're looking to launch the, the project in earnest on May the 1st. It would be disappointing if everyone was there from Sidmouth, Seaton and Axminster um, when, uh, and, and not many people from Honiton. So we're going to be advertising and marketing these events very differently to our normal fair. Um, our, our annual events programme from the countryside team, we can pretty much fill every single space uh, by using Facebook, Twitter and a uh, little bit of local advertising. This will be much more direct advertising in the town um, aimed at targeting those people who, who live specifically within Honiton. As I said, we're kicking off with a family fun day. We've got a range of different events from quite traditional um, walks and talks. We've got bluebell walks planned um, up at Nap Cops. Uh, we've got uh, a town centre bat walk um, planned for the summer months, which also has a bat box building event using material that we've harvested from um, our woodland at Hon uh, Holliford Woods uh, to create some very uh, sustainable local boxes to put up in gardens and things around the town to help bats uh, within Honiton. Uh, we've also got a series of family friendly volunteering sessions um, happening at weekends time slots to try and encourage a younger audience to come and take part in physically looking after the green space around Honiton. And then we've got other events which are more sort of bringing in the culture and arts um, themes. And so we're going to do some spoon carving workshops, which are very popular. And we've got a member of the team who's very proficient at that. Um, a green woodworking day taking place at Offwell Woods over the, over the hill from Honiton, where we'll have a day in the log cabin, um, harvesting some hazel, talking about the pr principles of coppicing and how it helps dormice, and then making hurdles and, and uh, pea sticks and other actual um, products from what we harvest there. Uh, we'll be doing charcoaling days and um, an apple day in the autumn at Honiton Bottom, where we could uh, bring in some sailing activities and maybe some dance and things like that for blessing the trees so that we get a good harvest for next year. Um, and uh, we're also going to be doing a bio blitz up at Hon uh, Nat Cops in the summer, where we invite lots and lots of different specialist ecologists from people who know loads about lichen all the way through to bird watchers and mammologists and will attempt in one day to log as many different species that live in that nature reserve as we can. And uh, public participation in citizen science is really embedded in those sorts of um, activities. So we've got lots and lots planned specifically for Honiton alongside our, our normal annual programme for the wider district as well. So that's a key uh, engagement tool for the project. Um, we're also looking to really increase volunteering and participation within the town itself. I've mentioned about the family friendly events taking place at the weekends. Those will be activities like hedge laying or scrub clearance, which are suitable for anyone sort of over the age of, of 10 to take part in. But we've also got our, um, our established volunteering network that we run through the countryside team, where we've got almost 300 people uh, registered as volunteers across the whole of the district. And I'd like to increase the participation from people specifically within Honiton for that as well, because we've got uh, the nature reserve at Honiton Bottom that we look after. And uh, there's also nap cops just over the hill. So within striking distance, there are some really important green spaces that people from the town can feel they're doing their bit to look after their local green space as well. So increasing that participation is key. 
We're also um, in advanced talks with Forestry England to um, take on responsibility for the Offwell Woodland um, Centre um, over in the woods there. We, we already work really closely with the Offwell Woodland Trust and we deliver all their education work in, in the woods each year. Um, they're at a position where they've run out of trustees and they've run out of steam for the sort of legal and uh, bureaucratic side of running the trust, but they don't want to lose contact with the woodland itself. And so our plan is to take them on board as a volunteer group. They continue to um, battle rhododendron and open up glades and rejuvenate the heathland area up there. Uh, whilst we take responsibility for the um, high level stewardship agreement that's down there and really ramping up the educational access that used to be uh, so prevalent um, 15 years ago. And it gives a really interesting woodland resource for the local community to make use of with the log cabin and field classroom down in the woods and the ponds and the bird watching opportunities that are down there as well. So we're really excited about that. And hence, a number of our Wild Honiton events are going to be themed and, and focused around Offwell itself. Um, the other photo there, the little hedgehog on a, on a post, is actually one that I've just uh, copied and pasted straight off the internet. So it's not one of mine, but um, we've commissioned a very similar set of uh, discovery trail posts to be put out at six sites um, around the town in an attempt to lead people from one place to the next. And if, for example, you're um, a regular walker in the morning at uh, Honiton Bottom uh, Community Nature Reserve, you may never have even heard about Nap Cops or um, you might not know about the Glen. And so each of these posts will have um, a charming little hedgehog carved on top so it fits within the, the flagship themes and a QR code on the side that you can scan. And that takes you um, into the discovery trail itself that will encourage you to then go and visit the other sites that are detailed and give you mapping and uh, direction advice as well, how to get around. Um, really simple, going in as the formal launch once all the uh, elections are behind us. So um, that can be more of a formal council uh, approach um, unveiling for that one. We've also been in discussion with Ruth and THG about uh, a, a very much a creative arts trail around the town as well. And Ruth's got some fabulous ideas there that um, she's taking forward to really sort of investigate nature through the, um, through the arts and culture uh, um, forum. So that would be really exciting to see that develop. Um, we've also had really good meetings with our street scene colleagues and part of the ethos of the Wild Towns project is to actually sort of break down the silo thinking that so often and silo working that so easily sort of gets into um, everyday life and make sure that we're hand in glove with all of our colleagues within the district council and town council as well. And so we've been chatting with colleagues in Street Scene about their plans for the Glen and other public space around um, Honiton as well. So whilst we won't be taking on responsibility for other sites, we've um, given uh, offers of help for um, Round Ball Woods, for example, helping with the, uh, the work that's going on up there. And uh, we can also bring our volunteers to help with bigger tasks that Street Scene have got planned um, in and around the town as well. So it's a bit of a, a cooperative approach that we're looking to take. So one thing I forgot, sorry, I'm gonna just go back to our volunteering because I did have notes and I've realized I've raced ahead of one of the other elements of volunteering that's actually happening on Tuesday next week. We've got a youth group from the Exeter Community Chiefs team. Um, they run a program called the HITS program, which sort of, picks up young people who've fallen out of mainstream education for whatever reason and gets them back on track with some formal education, some formal um, uh, uh, training in maths and English, 
but also um, introduces discipline through the sport of rugby and tries to broaden their um, sort of horizons. And I went to a presentation uh, a few months ago about um, that program and made contact with the, the, the manager to say, have you ever done any countryside volunteering, which they hadn't. And it spans both um, worlds so perfectly because it's a very physical approach, but it's also a potential career uh, progressing um, activity. So they're coming along next week to do a um, end of season gorse bashing se session up at uh, Napcops Nature Reserve. And that will um, hopefully be something we can continue on into the future in a new partnership there. So we've got 10 young people coming out to get um, to grips with uh, some of the overstood um, gorse. And we've also had groups from Honiton U3A and the WI who've been booked in for walks and talks as well. So whilst the public launch is happening on May the 1st, we have had soft launches up before then for stuff that was uh, sort of seasonally critical and we didn't want to miss out on just for the sake of, uh, of um, sort of starting everything at the same shotgun moment. So sorry about that, just um, tracking back. Um, so the marketing and publicity, obviously the, the public events are very much part of that and we'll need very good marketing um, so that we've got the correct target audience in attendance. But it's something we do very well already as part of the team. So we've got um, a newsletter that goes out to 3000 people locally. We've got our social media platforms and we've got good connections with local media uh, outlets um, on the radio, um, news broadcast and uh, printed media as well. So one of the threads that will come through with um, hopefully increasing uh, uh, sort of um, momentum will be to really push the Wild Honiton brand and the Wild Honiton theme and uh, get the messaging out there um, wherever we can um, to really uh, increase the uh, understanding and awareness of the concept of the project, but also those, those key biodiversity indicators behind it. Um, it's also probably the right point uh, to, to just note that it's not a sort of one hit wonder. We're not coming in for 12 months and then backing off again. This is very much how I'd like to see the countryside team engaging across the town um, for years to come. And so because of that, we're not looking to rush in the education strands immediately, uh, mainly because Penny, who's our brilliant education ranger, is already completely committed for the whole of the spring and summer terms this year. So we'll be looking to gear up the environmental education and the formal environmental education elements of the Wild Honiton project from September onwards. Um, but uh, that will really form quite a, a fundamental part of, of the project outputs, um, as well as increasing the children's understanding of, of how nature is working on their doorstep. They're also a brilliant conduit into households through the, throughout the town. So we'll be giving them introductory sessions, we'll be giving them lessons, plans, um, and also some materials to take home and, and share with their families about what it is to live alongside beavers and uh, what a difference they're going to make to their um, their uh, their river. So that's coming on uh, from September. So we've got a lot planned. Um, there's even more coming on stream from partner stakeholders. Um, and uh, as I said, it's it, learning from the lessons we got from Wild Exmouth but really looking to sort of embed this within, within the town. So happy to take any questions that you've got, um, but also hopefully from uh, next month onwards, anyone around Honiton and from May the 1st onwards, hopefully the whole of the district will really be um, hearing about Wild Honiton through our formal marketing channels. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Uh, James, that was uh, uh, fascinating. Um, I particularly like the bit about the environmental education. Okay, so um, are there any non-members who wish to um, raise their hands? I can see a couple of members, a couple of people. Okay, um, right, so Councillor, sorry, Councillor Colin Buchan and then we'll have Wendy as well. Okay, Colin. 
Thanks, Nick. Uh, great presentation, James. Is this going to become a going forward a regular sort of feature rolling out? Like, a, we're going to see like a wild ottery and things like that. Is this good? Is this your long term plan? Yeah, that's always been the plan. I think um, my pre well, my previous colleague Tim Daffon um, managed to secure the funding for the Wild Exmouth project, but it was always the intention that that would form a springboard for the way we work within the larger towns across the district so that it could be, well, as I've said already, we learn from, um, from how it's happened before and then we take that learning into each of the towns. So I would see, um, yeah, very much so that once we've got Wild Honiton up and functioning this year, we then move on to another town, start talking to street scene and town council colleagues within that community and engage communities with the nature on their doorstep because that's the commonality be behind all of this and it's it's very easy to replicate from, from town to town. Thank you. I mean, so I can see there's a lot of work goes into it. So you're looking at perhaps one town per year because that's all you can really manage because it's such a big project. Yes, yeah, absolutely. It, whilst I sort of say that the first year isn't the end of it, that we want to have that um, continuation of, of the approach it does have to be a ramping up of what we could do year on year so we want to start with a big hit and then continue the legacy after that um, but what what I can't get the team to do is, is promise to replicate the first year every single year um, to the same level because otherwise we'd, we'd be spreading ourselves too thin but yeah I think we start with a big you know festival type approach within the town and, uh, and then just keep the plates spinning once we've got those volunteers on board and let the natural uh, organic growth really sort of fuel that public participation, which underpins all the success. Last question, just a quick one. Is it the towns approaching you? Did Honiton approach you or did you approach Honiton? I mean, did the... I, I think it was always intended that Honiton would be the second port of call after Exmouth. I think strategically Exmouth had to come first from the funders perspective on HLF because it's such a, a large settlement within the district. But then it also coincided with the district council's move to Honiton. So it seemed right to keep things going within the town and, and to move on to that one next. But I wouldn't want to, these two uh, attempts to sort of then be the be all and end all. So yeah, very much looking to uh, to keep moving forward with with each of the town's perspectives um the one problem we're going to get we're going to have with certain um uh locations is that we've only got 10 local nature reserves across the district and they're not evenly spread out around each of the uh the population centers so there are going to be some where we've got to be a bit sort of creative with um the countryside team's provision actually within the town itself but that doesn't mean we can't bring our events and uh, and um, my space for nature approaches because we can always help people wild up their gardens a little bit and um, be justified in doing that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Colin. Okay, Wendy, over to you. Hi, um, James. That's really exciting. I'm so excited um, because I, I remember when you you kind of started a launch of Wild Honiton a few years back, yeah. and um, we we had Alan Bruford in the Beehive Community Garden at the back, and it was just wonderful because it was really cross generational. There were like three, uh, and there were people who wouldn't normally go to events as well. I think. I mean, just the feedback I got was terrific. That there, there were cross-generational. There were certainly grandparents coming with their son, daughter-in-law, with children, and they really enjoyed it and um, were really interested in just, you know, observing nature in their own town. Um, so I think it's amazing, and that you'll be using the Glen and going up to Vernon's Corner. And um, but my. Um, what was I going to ask you? And it's brilliant that you've taken over the off well. Um, I know the bureaucracy was proving to be a headache for people and older volunteers, but getting more people. I was going to ask you about hedgehog highways and things like that. You'll probably be encouraging people to do that. And I wondered if you wanted to link with the Honiton First Scouts as well, because they've just helped me do an incredible edible bed in the garden at the beehive. And I just think 
they're they're a real mind they, they love doing little projects so they'd be great and the litter pickers as well I'm yeah 100 sure percent um tapping into groups that already exist and a giving of their time like scouts or um litter pickers they are my absolute number one audience really because they're already there they're already doing it and um they're already committing their time so if we can help promote what they're doing and and showcase it hopefully it'll encourage more people to come out off the sofa and and do similar um but not do duplicating and yeah as you said unfortunately we did have a few false starts with this uh firstly due to covid and then secondly due to the covid induced complete rearrangement of the team we had a complete reshuffle and uh, it's all been very hectic in in the sort of transit period but we're at a position now where everyone's settled we're ready to go we're in the starting blocks and we've actually got some some tangible stuff to do but it's not a sort of done deal you know there's there's more space there's more capacity and anyone who has stuff to feed in it's it's a true partnership approach oh it'd be brilliant to get some involvement with villages in action because i mean i know we, we've got various different people that that we we we've worked with artists local especially climate um you know uh, responsible you know all, all about sustainability shows and stuff so i think that would be great to link yeah. up and collaborate sounds ideal okay thank you uh sarah you have a question hello um yes it was really brilliant to hear about um that project and it's it's great that it it feeds into theme two of the cultural strategy, which is protecting and enhancing the natural environment. Um, so just back to um, one of the original questions someone asked me earlier about monitoring and evaluation. Um, it'd be brilliant if you might be able to share some of the statistics of, of how many people attended and, and that kind of thing, and, and whether we can, um, that can then feed into the, the broader evaluation of the cultural strategy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it's something we do at a, a very simplistic level on all of our events. And with Wild Hon oh, sorry, with Wild Exmouth, the original project, there was an attempt to do a much more in-depth um, uh, survey and, and dissection of the impact and, and things. And that was the bit that really suffered from, from the COVID um, hiccup and, and hiatus. Um, and so we didn't get really robust uh, statistics back from participants. Um, it's also the hardest thing to get because if someone's turned up for a bat walk, um, they want to, you know, get a detector, switch it on, go truffling around looking for bats. And so actually sort of getting feedback of where they've come from and where they've heard about it and all that takes a lot of discipline from the event lead to actually garner that um, at the beginning. Uh, because once it's happened, you can never sort of grab that opening opportunity as well. So it's something I'm really keen to to develop um, through the public events, the um, and the public engagement, and uh, yeah. So obviously, all that information will be um, shared amongst the forum, definitely. Um, and I hope that we can actually get some very good uh, statistics, which allow us to. Um, develop and move the project in the coming years to actually respond to people's desires because it's one thing sort of coming up with a list from all the partners and stakeholders of what they want to do but ultimately we want to respond to the town's people themselves and find out what their priorities are we did a lot of that with the initial survey but that was um three years ago now so i'm sure you know there are new ideas new concepts new emergencies emerging that um we can help bring some uh, cooperation to bear on okay so, thank you very much uh i'll take it james um okay. okay so let's now moving on to um uh, agenda item 10 an update on wild escape and create our space so we have a verbal update from ruth and and uh, anna Bruce, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. Um, if I'm aware of time, Anna and I are going to keep it short and sweet and just deliver um, the top headlines from our two fabulous projects that we've launched this year. Uh, we're going to do it in chronological order. As Vic said, um, the World Escape project has had a quick turnaround. So 
it's now it's the 1st of March today, I can say that the project is actually going to be completed by the 22nd of April. Um, so I'm going to hand over to Anna now, who's going to share all the amazing work that she's been doing over the last two months. Thanks, Anna. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so just to be really keep it to sort of bullet point information, um, Wild Escape is a national project. It's happening all across the country. And I think the basic premise of it is to connect schools to heritage and nature um, using museums and artists. Uh, I think that's very basically what it's about. Um, it's funded by Art Fund, as you found out earlier. And um, yeah, we were so thrilled to get this project because it sits so even more perfectly within our program and our projects that we have coming than we realised. So um, we've partnered with um, All Hallows Museum in Honiton and the Blackdown Hills AOMB. And um, we're working with Honiton Primary School, um, taking uh, 28 children across the four classes they have in years four and five um, out uh, to the museum, out into Blackdown Hills and also to the gallery as a kind of uh, research aspect of it. And they're working with an artist called Alistair Lambert to create um, a kinetic sculpture, which is going to be really ex exciting. And then um, they have a lot of contact time with Alistair, who's a brilliant person to work with. And um, yeah, and we're the culmination of the project will be this fantastic procession from the primary school to the Thelma Holbert Gallery Garden uh, on Earth Day, which is the 22nd of April, which is also a national event. Um, and uh, yeah, we're going to have a kind of party basically in the garden as kind of festival feel. So we're hoping that we'll have a brass band. Um, certainly some food and drink and some themed activities that relate to what the children have been creating as part of uh, the project, um, including a storytelling fairy and uh, some woodland crafts. So it should be really great atmosphere here in the gallery um, in the garden here. Um, and the kids will have a great time, I think, over the whole project. Yeah, I guess that's probably all I should say to keep it sweet. <laughs> Thanks, Anna. Um, no, it's really amazing, actually, that this project that the, the kids or uh, the children get to go off timetable, they get to go to the museum, and they get to go to AOMB and actually walk in the footsteps of some of the creatures that they've been exploring, um, whether them that's are in the museum. We are reluctant to share the, the what the finale is going to be on the 22nd of April, because it's like a, it's a fabulous idea. Um, so you're just going to have to come along on Earth Day. And uh, as Anna said, have some food and drink and, um, and hear Vernon's brass band. But there's also going to be acoustic music. THD used to do a lot of uh, after dark events, festival parties, and it's our first one post COVID. So, um, and it's a lovely, it's a lovely project actually, because though, as Vic said, it was a tight turnaround with that bit of funding, it segues so beautifully into our 18 month Arts Council funded project. I think I mentioned um, in the last forum that we were going for it. and. Thankfully, we were awarded the full amount. So um, this month, um, the activity starts. The project's called Create Our Space, and it was designed to create inclusive opportunities to engage with arts, culture, and climate, responding to the needs of East Devon's young people aged 7 to 25. So that's the first time that we specifically focus on that age range. And we have got some quite high-profile partners. We're working, the project is co-delivered um, and funded with the University of Exeter, Quantum Community College um, and All Hallows. Um, so there's about four pillars in the project. Um, the first project is the appointment of an intern. Um, and this is the first time that we've worked with the University of Exeter um, and their business partnership scheme to um, host an intern for 15 hours a week for the next 10 years. Oh, 10 years. <laughs> I'd love that. No, 10 months. Um, so we've got uh, <laughs> Kiera, <laughs> Kiera uh, Devani Dykes. She starts next Tuesday and she's a student in visual culture and management. Um, and then we've been delivering um, or developing training opportunities for the young people. But for a THG, this is a really transformative moment. So it's going to be THG is for young people um, delivered by young people. So we've developed this youth network um, and the members of the network are from all over East Devon. Um, a lot of the students from Huntington Community College, but also mixing um, with students from the University of Exeter. Um, they'll be receiving training, they'll have the opportunity to co-create exhibitions in our space for the next year, 
um, to deliver workshops, to, to go out with our creative cabin. Um, the first exhibition that is, is part of the Create Our Space project is called Paradise Found, and that opens on the 18th of March, 17 days. <laughs> um, and that's a big project for us. Um, really, really ambitious. I don't think THG has done anything quite like it before. We've done something similar, but so it's 36 artists who have walked in the footsteps of the Camden Town Group who worked in the Black Down Hills. Um, and they've revisited 12 of the famous sites. Uh, so the Hidden Church, Luppet, Hart Farm, Apple Hayes, Dumpton Hill. So these 36 artists will have contemporary renditions of these historical sites. And we've got uh, 12 loans of historical works coming in alongside, um, I think it's going to be about 60 artworks. So THG is going to be full. <laughs> um, and it's, it's just a fabulous opportunity for us to deliver a workshop program for, in, in the gallery, but then taking all of those expertise out into different um, sites across East Devon. Um, so the Creative Cabin, as you all know, we love it and our communities love it and delighted that um, we have the funding to keep it going. Um, so that's going to be going around all the festivals, Exxon Festival, Sid Fest, Food Fest, all the festivals, hopefully. Um, but also delighted to share that um, with Sarah's help, um, the cabin has now got a dedicated culture vehicle um, to the SPF fund so that we can um, really reach our communities and be as responsive as we need. So in addition to all the activities that we've got the funding for from art fund working with Southwest Museums and, and Art Council, we can also now work with Cranbrook um, it's going to help us um, deliver our Wild Honiton commitment. Um, we're going to be going to the housing estates in East Devon and also working with our refugee communities. Um, and finally, um, hopefully you've all seen our current exhibition at the Thelma Hobbit Gallery, which is by Leonie Hampton. Um, it's our second Guardian review this year. So we're on a roll. Hopefully we'll get another one with uh, Paradise Found. Um, but that exhibition culminates this Saturday with Honiton's Climate Conversation Seed Swap. Um, so please do come on down. I think there's a few tickets left. Um, and Leonie Hampton will be in conversation with Jane Catford, who is a reader in uh, ecology at King's College, and Lulu Urquhart. So if you're into your garden designs, she won the RHS Chelsea Flower Show in 2022. Um, and bring some seeds to swap. Um, it's the first time we've ever hosted the seed swap, so we're... Um, we're honing it <laughs> but uh, it should be fun um so please do join us and thank you all so much uh, for your uh, participation in this event and i will hand back to councillor nick cookway to round up okay thank you very much indeed uh that uh, sounds very intriguing earth day I, I might be tempted to come and have a look at that see what's going on but also a fantastic amount of work going on at the thg uh, thank you very much indeed do we have any questions uh, there's one person who wanted to add something into the um, final point. Uh, oh, yes, C Councillor Buchan. Colin. Hi, Ruth. Yeah, L lovely to hear that. Are all the dates on your T THG website? I mean, so we're gonna know, we'll know when you're coming to our area. That's a very good point. Um, so in terms of the, uh, the festivals, um, then we don't think we have got those up yet. Um, but the, we usually have at least two months worth of programming. So we won't have what, what we're doing in August. But um, when the new intern starts, her first job is actually to produce a flyer of the cabin's commitment. So, yes, it will be coming very soon. Watch this space. <laughs> yes. OK, thank you very much indeed. Um, David, David Knox, uh, uh, did you have a question or did you have wanted to make a comment? I had a, a note earlier on that you wanted to say something. Um, I don't have a, <clears throat> I, want, I wanted to give an update on my core music champion activities, if that's okay. Uh, I've yes. Got, I've, can I've can, can you? Very brief slides. Okay. Um, uh, uh, well, slides. Slides might be a problem, but um, please do go ahead. Yes. Okay. I'll try and. Uh, I can't share my screen. Oh yeah. Okay. You got co-host. Yeah. Well. Uh, is that going to work now? Uh, I think to bear with, we can just make you co-host and then you can share your screen. Uh, okay, so David, you should be able to share your screen now. Hmm. 
Right, um, David, are you able to um, show us something? Uh, I don't know what's happening here. David, you've muted yourself. Okay, right, that's a shame. Uh, I'll say, is there any help we can give? I mean, he's sharing his screen at the moment, but not the slides. Okay, um, he, and David, you're still on Can mute. you hear me now? Yeah, we can now, thank you. Okay, I'll try and share my screen again. Can you see that now? Yes. Yes, thank you. Yes, we can. So I just wanted to give a really quick update to um, where, where we're at. Um, some of you may already be aware of what we do, but I'll just run through it very quickly. I'm the promoter for the King of Clubs in Ottery St. Mary and the music champion within the ACE network. Um, uh, la last year, I opened the King of Clubs, which is a 150 capacity venue behind the King's Arms in Ottery. It had been disused for quite a long time, and we set it up in partnership with the King's Arms as a self-funded venture where the door money pays the artists and hire fees. Uh, we've developed a bar, stage area, lights and PA, and we use this for artists to get photography and videos. We did 20 shows last year and created opportunities for 60 local musicians. And we recently added um, live recording. Uh, we've got quite a few musicians and the project into the newspapers. Um, this is a snapshot of some of the shows that we did. And one of the biggest outputs of it was a, a local band called The Cabins who gave us our first sold out show and have gone on to um, do great things. Uh, they're currently on a national tour. Um, and so this has kind of informed our future where attendance for some of the shows was quite low. So we're now going to focus this year on what worked in terms of photos, videos um, and, and what have you. The development we did for the cabins worked really well. We met them before their first gig, coached them, gave them rehearsal space, um, equipment, and put them on. They've done really, really well, and they signed a record deal six months after the first show and are now currently on a national tour, um, and I'm supporting them by co-managing with their label. So our focus this year is shifting <clears throat> to um, um, emerging artist development, and we're going to be we're building a battle of the bands with as a vehicle to do that. Um, so we've started recording young bands. Uh, uh, we've recorded the cabins, a band called Pack of Animals from Bradnich, who've also played the King of Clubs, and we're hoping to find the next cabins. So our bat battle of bands will focus around um, various heats with performance opportunities at Octree uh, Food Festival, Exeter Street Arts Festival. We'll be recording and releasing music for people that participate as well as offering chances to support the cabins. Um, so I'm hoping to also involve Sydney Sea Festival and Folk Week for opportunities and linkages. <clears throat> and so far I've got the Rock Project, who run a school of rock regionally, the Music in Devon Initiative, King's School, Richard Hewish College, Exeter College and Exeter Academy of Music. Um, we're also linking with the Ottery Project with, with Wendy. Um, and I'm exploring the possibility for a recording studio in Honiton, as well as rehearsal space and training for young artists. Um, and we're also looking at offering a work experience project around um, the various festivals for live sound, live recording, film and promotional activities. Um, that's really all I wanted to mention just now, just to give a really quick update to what we're actually doing this year. Does anybody have any questions? I've tried to be that, make that right, nice and quick. Thanks, David. Okay, thank you. Thank you, David. That's absolutely fascinating and uh, really impressive. Uh, and um, this is exactly the sort of thing that um, uh, the, the uh, cultural studies intended to, to promote. Brilliant. Okay. Um, now, if, if you could stop your screen sharing, I can see the rest of yeah, the sorry. group. Thanks, because we've got a couple of, oh, we have at least one hand up. Right. Okay. So uh, let us go to uh, Jess McGill, please. Oh, hiya. Yeah, that's really great to hear, David, about um, that kind of development of uh, local uh, musicians into artists. Um, obviously, at the Xmas Festival, I'm putting together the music programme. Um, and so we'll be keen to discuss, you know, a similar thing, possibly offering a slot or at least um, maybe opening up some opportunities to, to some of those bands. 
Fabulous. We've uh, applied for the cabin supply, funnily enough. Okay. Um, I'd yeah, I've got a big spreadsheet, which I haven't worked all of my way through yet. So I'll, uh, <laughs> no, no, <sorry. laughs> of uh, the applications, but um, yeah. Um, uh, what, uh, would you be able to share your contacts so we can maybe have a follow up chat about how that might work? Yep, absolutely. I'll put that in the chat for you. Fabulous. Thank you. OK, um, thank you. Well, that sounds really fabulous. If we can get local local bands at the Exmouth Festival, that would be brilliant. I look forward to seeing that. OK. Um, very exciting. Speaking as an expert resident, of course, uh, and an expert board member. Um, so, uh, Wendy. Hi. Yeah. Uh, just to say, I uh, I went to see the cabins on Saturday night. It was a great night, and you will get the Ute. And it's uh, yeah, they're really good. They're great. And uh, Dave did a terrific job there. Um, and also, just to say, we've got a problem because um, we can't actually save the chat. I don't know if there's a way of doing that because um, everybody's lovely contact details and stuff are in here, but we can't seem to save it. I don't know if anyone else can nail that for me. <laughs> Thanks. OK, um, I'm not sure about that one. Um, or we'll have a uh, we'll, we'll have a think, but I'm sure Ruth and um, Sarah will yep. um, help you with that. Because that's yeah, a very, very important. Need. Very important. We, we can make the e, the e introductions, no problem. OK, brilliant. Right. Now, I don't see any other hands up uh, and we've now reached the end of our agenda. Uh, so I'm now going to uh, start to uh, close the meeting. Uh, um, so this brings our meeting to an end. And I would like to thank everybody for taking part, including members of the public, uh, for their attendance. Members, can I remind you? that until Democratic Service Team confirm that live streaming and the recording has stopped, you can still be seen.